The Netflix documentary series Making a Murderer is one that is not only a two-part story about a man who was possibly framed for murder not once but twice, but is a master class, if you will, of going and proving just how illogical the law system can be at times and how certain people are willing to break it in order to try and get the dirt they need. The second case that is talked about in this trial is still very much an ongoing matter and there are those who hate the documentary because of how they come off in it, including the prosecutor Ken Kratz who made statements recently that shine a light on how much he hates that show. So allow us to show you how these quotes from Ken Kratz's latest book might infuriate you. Who is Ken Kratz? The man known as Ken Kratz was a very key part in the case that was depicted in Making a Murder, and his history is a bit murkier than he would like you to believe. We'll break it down for you. Ken Kratz worked in the La Crosse, Wisconsin City Attorney's Office as an assistant city attorney from 1985 to 1987. He served as an assistant district attorney in La Crosse County, Wisconsin from 1987 to 1992, and he went and prosecuted a wide variety of cases involving drugs, families, and more. Kratz was appointed District Attorney of Calumet County by Wisconsin Governor Tommy Thompson in 1992. He was the only applicant for the post. He served as President of the Wisconsin District Attorneys Association in 1996. Kratz also chaired the Wisconsin Victim Rights Council in 1993 as well as its successor, the Wisconsin Crime Victims Rights Board from 1998 to 2010. So as you can see, he wasn't just a random person assigned to the case we're about to get to. He was someone who was experienced and had a variety of roles within the law, making him more than qualified to handle big cases. Or at least that's what he and many others would say. Kratz was appointed special prosecutor and headed the investigation and prosecutions of Stephen Avery and Brendan Dassey in neighboring Manitowoc County in 2005. Manitowoc County had to recuse its officials because it was being sued by Avery for wrongful conviction following his exoneration in 2003. Kratz gained convictions of both defendants in trials in 2007. Avery was sentenced to life without parole. Dassey, then 17, was sentenced to life imprisonment with no parole before he reached the age of 56. Dassey's conviction was provisionally overturned in August 2016, subject to appellate review. As for making a murderer, Kratz did not cooperate with the producers or interviewers in the series. He later criticized them, saying they had left out key pieces of evidence. After the release of the series, Kratz began receiving death threats. It got so bad that people actually went to his Yelp page of all things and criticized him even more based on what they saw him do in the series. For the record, that is not the way to handle things, and yet it once again shows just how strongly viewers felt about the case based on what they had seen. But as a certain someone would state, just because you see something framed in a certain way doesn't mean that is exactly what happened, which he was happy to express in his book. In his latest book, Avery, The Case Against Stephen Avery and What Making a Murderer Got Wrong begins with the following statement. My name is Ken Kratz. You may know me as the chief villain in a Netflix docuseries, Making a Murderer. Given that audiences were emotionally invested in the trials of both Stephen Avery and Brendan Dassey, Kratz became a central figure for the public to direct their anger at amid this perceived perversion of justice. Kratz declined to be interviewed for the Netflix series, but he's quite vocal about the proceedings in his latest book. Regarding the fact that the then 16-year-old Dassey clearly had cognitive disabilities and was perhaps asked leading questions during his investigation, the reason for his retrial, Kratz reiterated his belief that Dassey is guilty. I lose no sleep over my prosecution of Brendan Dassey. I was a prosecutor with a dead young woman and her surviving family for which to pursue justice, said Kratz. It was not my fault that Brendan was easily manipulated by Avery or had a low IQ or was shy or that he made a dozen inconsistent statements. I believe Brendan could have saved Teresa's life, but chose instead to involve himself in the rape, murder, and mutilation of an innocent woman. I've always said that he did not deserve life in prison and should have taken the plea bargain that I offered him. Unsurprisingly, Kratz is also convinced that Stephen Avery is guilty. Timing and technology, I thought, underpinned making a murderer's success. The show burst out during an electric, transformative pre-Trump period in our country. 
notoriously conservative America seem to be leaning left, newly willing to challenge law enforcement. Many of the police shootings that fueled the Black Lives Matter movement resulted in no charges being filed against cops. Think Baltimore and Ferguson. And yet the American public clamored for the freedom of a white man, Stephen Avery, who was, by any measure of the evidence, stone guilty. This fascinated and frankly surprised me. When making a murderer took home four Emmys, it seemed that those who judge popular culture had sanctioned a new found activist spirit, if one inconsistently applied. As audiences watched Making a Murderer, there was one pivotal moment when it appeared that Avery's legal team of Dean Strang and Jerry Buting had secured a breakthrough that they were desperately searching for, finding the vial of Stephen Avery's blood which appeared to have been tampered with. Kratz was critical of the filmmakers for their representation of that moment. We see close shots of the broken seal on a box that contains the vial of blood. We do not hear that the seal was broken in the presence of Avery's own Innocence Project defense team in 2002 in a meeting to review the available physical evidence for retesting in pursuit of his eventual exoneration. We do not hear that the hole in the top of the tube was actually made by a nurse when the blood was first collected from Stephen Avery not by some phantom police conspirator. This is how all blood gets into collection tubes, as you are probably aware if you had ever had blood drawn yourself. So yeah, he's not the biggest fan of the documentary series, as you can see. Previous comments. And to be clear, this wasn't the only time that he spoke out on the show and what it represented him as. He did a massive email breaking down every single point that he felt was wrong with the show. But here's an outline of that. There's more, of course, but I'm not a DA anymore. I have no duty to show what nonsense the planting defense is or why the documentary makers didn't provide these uncontested facts to the audience. You see, these facts are inconsistent with the claim that these men were framed. You don't want to muddy up a perfectly good conspiracy movie with what actually happened and certainly not provide the audience with the evidence the jury considered to reject that claim. Finally, I engaged in deplorable behavior sending suggestive text messages to a crime victim in October 2009. I reported myself to the OLR. My law license was thereafter suspended for four months. I have withstood a boatload of other consequences as a result of that behavior, including loss of my prosecution career. However, I've enjoyed sobriety from prescription drug use for over five years now and refused to be defined by that dark time of my life. All of this occurred years after the Avery case was concluded. I'm unclear why the defense created documentary chose to include this unpleasantness in this movie, especially if the filmmakers had no agenda to cast me as a villain. I am not a victim in that whole texting scandal. Then again, it's exceedingly unfair to use that to characterize me as morally unfit. To identify Lieutenant Lenk Sergeant Coburn and myself as being responsible for the framing and knowing false murder conviction of Stephen Avery is irresponsible and inconsistent with the consideration of all the evidence presented. Netflix should either provide an opportunity for rebuttal or alert the viewers that the series was produced by and for the defense of Stephen Avery and contains only the opinion and theory of the defense team. Now, it should be noted that he did leave office because of a scandal and yet he denies that this is relevant in any way. But you can bet those who believe Avery and Dassey aren't going to take kindly to his words or his book. So what do you think? What do you think of this look at the prosecutor behind one of Making a Murderer's biggest cases and how he feels about things as a whole? Are you surprised that this happened the way it did? Do you feel his quotes are out of line? Let us know in the comments below and be sure to subscribe and we'll see you next time.